Bitcoin in free fall. The cryptocurrency hit a record high towards the end of 2017, but in the last month it's lost almost half its value. What's behind that? And can virtual coins ever be trusted? This is Inside Story. Hello, I'm Jane Dutton. This is Inside Story from our headquarters in Doha. They've made some people millionaires. Others have lost a fortune. Cryptocurrencies are volatile. There's no doubt about that. And for those who invest, it can be a roller coaster of a ride from all time high to a new low in less than two months. Cryptocurrencies took the world economy by surprise. The first, Bitcoin, launched in 2009. Now there are more than 1,300 and regulators are taking them more seriously. China, India and South Korea have introduced tougher regulations to combat fraud and tax evasion. JP Morgan and Bank of America say they are halting the purchase of cryptocurrencies on their credit cards. And Facebook has banned advertising for the virtual coin. A sustainable market or a bubble about to burst? We'll talk to our guests in a moment. But first, let's have a look at the cryptocurrency market. Bitcoin, the largest of the virtual currencies, has fallen dramatically in value from its high of 20,000 US dollars to below 8,000 on Friday. Ethereum and Ripple also saw drops of about 20%. The market's been under pressure to sell this past week with more than $100 billion wiped off in 24 hours. That still leaves the global market value at about 400 billion, according to industry tracker coinmarketcap.com. Last week, $530 million was hacked from an exchange in Japan, renewing concerns about security. Let's bring in our panel joining us from New York, Nathan Epen, Chief Information Officer at Arcadia Crypto Ventures, and someone who has been a Bitcoin trader from London. Martin Bakidaxa, financial analyst and London bureau chief for The Street. And from Sydney, David Vale, executive director of the Cyber Law and Policy Community at the University of New South Wales. A very warm welcome to all three of you, gentlemen. Nathan Epen, as a trader, what is it that we saw? What is it that we are seeing at the moment? This is nothing, you see. Uh, it's just fallen 20% this week. Maybe in the two months, it's fallen 50%. I used to remember times when this was $1 today morning, it goes to $10 and it comes back to $3. So compared to that, this is nothing. Now for all the newbies out there, yo, oh my God, this is like, uh, they're gonna get crushed. But this is not classical music or jazz, this is punk rock. And you have to be ready for that. If you're expecting classical music, something that's very, very calm, well, you are in for a surprise. So you say this is like par for the course because earlier, it is a cryptocurrency and if you want to play the game, you better get used to this kind of stress. Yes, you better get used because this is a very nascent field even now. See, what percentage of people are in crypto? And this is changing the world because uh, it's like, you know, this is like 1994 in the internet, you know, a uh, some, uh, thing like, you know, Bezos comes out and says people are going to buy books on the internet. Nobody believed him. By 1998, most of the analysts out there were saying that around, uh, uh, by 2002, internet is not going to be there. There's not going to be any internet and all this hype is going to go away. So in between that, prices went up, prices go down. But the whole space is expanding. The same thing is going to happen to the tokenization or the utility token market or the security token market. Everything that we see around us are, is going to get tokenized. I'm not going to say it's going to happen tomorrow, but it's, in, it's going to happen in the next 10 to 20 years. And you can, be, you can decide to be early on it or you can come later. It doesn't matter because you can be part of this revolution. You can be ahead of the curve or you can come in later. Okay. But this is happening. It's happening in front of us. Martin Bakker, uh, what do you think has happened? Is this it? any less or more scary for you? 
I think it's significantly more scary. I think he makes a good point that the volatility has been around for quite some time. But there's a great difference between trading at $1 and $3 than there is trading at $9,000 and $19,000, which is what we're seeing right now. The potential for pain is a lot more significant, and the stakes are significantly higher. The one point I would make is that I do agree in 1994 we were all questioning the validity of the Internet as a commercial vehicle. But there was only one Internet. We've got 1,300 cryptocurrencies right now. And whether or not you believe that this is going to be the transaction method of the future is really irrelevant. It is what is going to be the single token that we use, or are we going to use multiple tokens? If we use single, and what is a good commercial vehicle here? Yeah. I mean, are they all? Worth so excuse me, jumping in. Are they all good commercial vehicles, or mm. are no, there no, some that are better than others? This is just it. At the present. None of them really do anything that we can't already do. Payment systems are already in place. They're much faster. They're much more efficient. They cost less. They take up less energy. And in fact, they're safer. So at the moment, nobody has explained to me exactly why these cryptocurrencies are more valid than payment systems that already exist. And I should put it more importantly, payment systems which are accepted by the commercial universe and regulators and central bankers. I would have a lot more faith in investing in those payment systems than I would in speculating which of these 13 crypto, 1,300 cryptocurrencies are going to ultimately win the race to be digital tokens of the future. David Vale, what is your take on what we've seen, the dramatic rise and now the recent plummet in cryptocurrencies, particularly the, 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 big, the big ones? What's going on here? Well, look, I suppose it just uh, emphasises the same questions that uh, people have been asking um, more so very recently, which is, what is this thing? What what, what are these uh, technologies? Are they currencies? Are they assets? Are they gambling tokens? There's no doubt that the underlying technology, the blockchain technology, has a lot of potential uses. Um, whether any of those are currencies, I think, are um, not really proven yet. Uh, if, if a currency jumps by 10% a day, then uh, you know, no one can really decide, know whether the, what price they're paying for anything. And so th th there's always been um, that problem, and there's always been a problem with, in terms of currency that you can't pay taxes in it, which is one of the uh, key features of a, a fiat currency. As for an asset, the, the, the other question is what's it backed by? And increasingly, uh, it's obvious that it relies on confidence, but uh, in terms of anything else behind it, it's a matter of consensus. And so uh, when the conveyor belt or the rocket is going up, uh, the consensus suddenly gives you a $10,000 increase in the value in a very short time. But when it disappears, then you're left with nothing. And so I, I suppose that the, the real problem is it's about risk. It's about understanding what's behind this. And it's also about the sophistication of the users. Um, rather than 1994, I'd wonder whether the, the, the analogy is really uh, 2007, 2008, when the global financial crisis was about to unravel all of the fin sophisticated financial derivatives that had sort of been building and building and building for sort of 10 or 20 years. And, and it turned out when the music stopped then that uh, uh, even apparently quite sophisticated um, players like uh, municipal bodies who were, thought they were investing discovered that uh, nobody knew where the risk really went. Nobody knew what happened when the music stopped. And so um, very quickly you had uh, a crisis of, of confidence. Um, I suppose two or three days ago you would have said we're on the way off the edge of the cliff. I see it's jumped by 10% today. So um, who knows where it's going? But who um, knows? That's a big question. Like Let me bring thing. Martin in here. Several important points raised by David there. What sort of investors this market attracts, and how do we look at it? I mean, is it a currency? Is it an asset? I should imagine that that's very important to determine, firstly from a legal point of view, and how we deal with it going forward. No question. I think David raises an important point when, it ta when he talks about the ability to transact if you don't know what the value is going to be in 24 hours' time because the transaction process is quite slow in a Bitcoin universe. So I might pay for a car with a Bitcoin this afternoon, and I don't know whether I've gotten a good deal when the transaction closes a few hours later or indeed tomorrow when I take delivery of the car. That doesn't make it an efficient way for us to trade goods and services. But I think ultimately what we're looking at now is whether or not we are talking about 
bitcoins and blockchain as a platform or whether we're talking about them as an asset. I believe in the concept of the platform. I'm less excited about blockchain. It's been around for about 10 years. It didn't have a great deal of utility three years ago. We're talking about it now only because Bitcoin's traded at $20,000 a piece. The blockchain itself isn't revolutionary, uh, isn't revolutionary, I should say, and it isn't actually revelatory either. But it is interesting, and it does have some validity in the commercial purpose. We, want, we need to descend or dissect the difference between the blockchain and the Bitcoins. The Bitcoins are speculation. They're not a currency. They're not even an asset. As far as I'm concerned, they're a gamble. They could be worth billions. They could be worth zero. The platform itself, that's where you've got a story. And for me, that's incredibly compelling. The Bitcoins themselves, they're entertaining. I wouldn't say they've got a whole lot of value. Nathan, what do you say in response to that? Is it important to separate See, Bitcoin from the platforms sure. here? Uh, is that the way to go forward? considering the volatility surrounding the cryptocurrencies? No. The, is this the, important to establish? See, blockchain, see, I, I'm a coder, I'm a technologist. I started this from technology. This whole blockchain people are telling it's a great platform. It's just a database. Why don't you say you like Oracle better? It's just a database. Without the consensus mechanism and the incentive called Bitcoin, this platform or this database is absolutely useless, okay? If you, you look into the technology piece of it, you can use it as an asset, you can use it as a gambling platform, you can use it as anything, Bitcoin, okay? That's up to you. It depends on what you want to do. Now, telling that it is not uh, stable or it's increasing in value, you can't use it, it's like saying, you know, we are in the buggy era and a car has come out and all the buggy owners are saying, oh, this car is a useless thing, it's clunky, it falls down, it does not have a wiper. That's a technology problem, somebody will fix it. There is an Einstein or somebody like that who'll come and fix it. But there is going to be a point where if you are still thinking that the buggy is going to be the future in 2000 when you are sitting in 1900, well, that's not going to be the case. Bitcoin is, or the blockchain and Bitcoin are different kinds of coins are going to take over. Now, regarding multiple cryptocurrencies, you can have multiple currencies. You have the euro, you have the US dollar, you have Indian rupee, you have the Chinese yuan, and you're using all that. Same way, they could end up being 13,000 currencies. It depends on what you want to use. And I mean, is it is still effective as a, as a purchasing it is not about value. power, Bitcoin, for example, Martin? I don't think that you are correct in comparing the multiple currencies to the multiple Bitcoins and the multiple coins that are out there in the marketplace, simply because when we talk about the euro, the yen, the rupee, and the dollar, they're all backed by the full faith and credit of enormously strong economies. They're, ba they're backed by taxpayers, backed by the central bank. We understand no, what no. underneath allows them to create a particular value. I have no idea who backs Bitcoin. I don't even know the name of the guy who created it. I don't know the you people don't who back the biggest back exchanges it. in the world. I don't I'll even know you. where they're located. Those are two significant risks I, that I'm not willing I mean, to I was going to say, it all sounds I'll, I'll kind of you. crazy, doesn't it, if you don't know who's behind it, what the true value of, of <laughs> Bitcoin who is. Who invented Bitcoin? We don't know. <laughs> we don't know the people who are sitting on this committee who are verifying the blockchain. We're David, is that one of the problems? We don't really know where this starts, where this ends. What sort of checks and balances there are in blockchains? I mean, one of the things is that uh, there's many things that we're talking about. That Bitcoin is a particular implementation of the blockchain technology. It's a particular cryptocurrency, but there's 1,300 other currencies, cryptocurrencies, and there's many other different ways to use a blockchain type technology. Um, it's also uh, many different sort of, uh, I suppose, political or governance models behind this. So uh, Bitcoin itself is a, uh, essentially a, a crypto anarchist um, method for uh, avoiding uh, identification, for avoiding central banks, for avoiding uh, a lot of the problems that come with identified central banked um, currencies, but also um, a lot of the advantages for consumers, like the fact that you can trust many of them and that uh, uh, when some Thing goes wrong there's someone standing behind that at the other end um, blockchain technology is being used or is being experimented with by some very large very mainstream uh, financial entities and also governments and they have no intention of it being you know a crypto anarchist experiment they want to put in all of the know your customer and other sorts of identification functions uh, that work in other areas of business and of of the economy and so one of the problems I think is bundling everything together as if one cryptocurrency is like another and one use of blockchain is like another um, part of the problem for ordinary people for ordinary business people or for, for consumers, uh, ordinary citizens, is that the level of 
knowledge and sophistication and sort of technical understanding and business understanding that you need to work out exactly what you're dealing with is pretty high. It's much higher than saying, oh, should I travel with American dollars or yen or, or whatever? Um, because even the, the nature of, of a, an asset, a currency or a gambling token is unclear and the comparability of the risks in different types of systems, the speed, the, those sorts of things, it's all um, very technical and very variable. It means that uh, a lot of people in this market, a lot of people in the, using this for transactions, really you'd have to count as unsophisticated and probably at risk of uh, doing things that they don't understand and being exposed to risks that, that they don't understand. Okay, so and clearly, Mark, not, and I think, you know, a, a uh, very... I mean, it seems that people need to be better educated and surely regulations will have a place here in the sense that they might bring back some sort of stability, that they might draw more confidence when it comes to this market, whatever it is, if it's a currency or not a currency. Is that what can is I, needed here? here? And I also want to ask you something else. When, when this billion was wiped off this market, where did it go? <laughs> <laughs> this is to me in London. That's an excellent question. <laughs> The, the money, it's, it's a zero-sum game in, in a certain sense because the money is simply going to transfer from one entity to the next and whether or not it exists inside the Bitcoin structure or whether it gets pulled out into real cash, that's the difference as to where the money goes. And actually, that raises no, no, a really no, interesting the, point because the analogy is... that I like to draw is when you own a share in Apple, for instance, it doesn't matter whether everybody else sells their shares in Apple. You still have a piece of paper that gives you a small portion of the profits going forward for the sale of iPhones and iPads and everything else like that. Everybody could leave. You'd still have that piece of paper that would have the value of profits. If everybody leaves Bitcoin, I don't have anything of value. Uh, you, let's in say fact, if you're buying I Tesla. I probably have something that has no value no, whatsoever. that's not true. Okay, the value of Bitcoin only increases. No, no, no. Okay. The value of Bitcoin only increases when more people participate. And when fewer people participate, the value decreases. That, for me, is a very uncomfortable legal structure what about the value of that gold, creates then? a great deal of risk for people who don't know what they're in. Nathan? You, you go ahead. T Tesla shares. Let's say, let, let's say you have Tesla shares. There's no dividend. It's, sharing at, uh, it's, uh, it's trading at $350. What are you buying that for, then? Or if you're buying gold, well, it, it, is, it is only having value because more people buy gold. Otherwise, why should it be at $1,600? I agree with that. It's a yellow that. metal. It's shining. It's only used for 7%, right? So it is trading at $1,600. That is called social consensus. So let's say you go to sleep tonight. I agree. And your wife tells you, you know what? I want an ounce of gold. And if you had 1600 you tell her, okay, I'll buy you this piece of gold tomorrow morning. You wake up in the morning, and if it's by the snap of a finger, everybody around you is only paying $100, you're not going to pay 1600 Yeah. You will only pay 100 So it is social consensus. The one Any liquid, the one difference liquid that asset I would, I think is pure social consensus. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. The one caveat I would say, though, yeah, so is that central banks around so the world hold tons of gold. They don't own any Bitcoin. So there is a, there's a floor to the they price can't. of gold they cannot. because of that they social consensus. We don't have that consensus yet in Bitcoin. OK, how, David, I'm going to bring you in here. How do we get that sort of consensus? And clearly, regulation is going to become an issue as we go ahead. Look at what's happened in, in South Korea, the sort of regulation that Russia is looking at, that it, there should be some sort of unified regulation. How is it going to be better placed? Where should it be placed to make this if, more acceptable? If I could come in on the fascinating thing about uh, Bitcoin is that it's not built on the, I suppose, the assertion, the command of any central government. Uh, the, the attraction for, for some of the, the uh, users is that it is based on consensus. There's three consensuses. There's, there's one that any individual block is valid, and that's what all of the uh, crypto mining is about. Another one is the actual uh, mechanism, the technical frame that it's working in. And so this is where you see splits of, of chains and that sort of thing. And the third thing, the, the most interesting one, is that it's worth something. And the, the, the miraculous sort of uh, creation of, of Bitcoin as a thing that actually worked 
needed all of those three things, those three types of consensus among strangers to just bubble up together. And so that was the improbable thing. And that was the great achievement that you had um, a, a, an essential agreement among strangers uh, on each of those three quite different levels. And that came forward. Um, the problem now is that uh, you, you're finding that uh, um, the technical problems of uh, getting consensus about each block, um, particularly with the Bitcoin model, creates huge demand for electricity. It becomes slow and, and there's, there's some problems there. The uh, technical demands of uh, consensus about the, the framework or the protocols I've seen the fragmentation and the creation of, of 1,300 different sort of currencies. And so it's it's very unclear, uh, does that go on forever? Is next week, is there 100,000 currencies or, you know, what's the limit there? And the but other what, what about a government of, uh, sponsored currency? Well, in a sense, the government steps in and says, well, we don't care about consensus. We are going to say it's worth this or uh, we're going to set up a, a trading mechanism that lets, um, you know, ordinary uh, markets decide the price uh, of this, but within sort of controls. And we don't need uh, consensus about technical framework. We don't need consensus that it's worth anything. We just work on um, within very closed bounds, within in uh, the sort of highly governed uh, infrastructure and highly governed sort of social and business sort of frameworks. Okay. Those are the things that government provides and it's not about consensus. Martin, who is doing it well at the moment? What do you make of so South Korea's moves? And look what's happening in Zimbabwe and Venezuela at the moment, how well cryptocurrencies are being used there. Can it all be melded together to provide the perfect platform. This is, I, I think it's fascinating because I do think it has some incredible utility for people who are participating in economies that don't really have significant backing of their currency or indeed central banks that are trusted. And I can understand in places like Zimbabwe and Venezuela why you would want to go into a marketplace that you could at least have some confidence that the value that you have created is going to be stored. Now, there's an incredible amount of volatility in Bitcoin, but there's even more in <laughs> Venezuelan currencies and indeed in Zimbabwean as well. So you can understand why there would be attraction there. But I guess I would say that in many respects, all of us are using digital currencies as we speak. It's not like we're walking around with enormous bags of cash in our pockets when we go out and buy our coffee. I take my card, I touch the thing, I get my Starbucks, and I'm on my way. That's a digital currency in many respects. And what the banks and the central banks do is they trade digital currencies amongst themselves. The amount of actual notes, dollar notes, that are in the marketplace and out in the real world are infinitesimal compared to the value of goods and services that are changed each day. So we're already in a world, in some respects, of digital currencies. So that platform and that concept does exist. That's why I've been skeptical of the idea of Bitcoin coming in at a 45 degree angle and, and people assuming that it's a brand new futuristic technology. We've been doing this in fractional reserve banking for decades I'll explain now. That, though. This isn't new. This okay, is actually Ni relatively old. Nathan. Off you go. I mean, clearly, I, I should imagine you're going to say that yes. we're certainly not so in, a, I, 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 in any I, I, sort I, of bubble. So I'm just wondering where to from here now for cryptocurrencies and uh, so let me and respond to. Okay, two, two or three things I want to bring into point. One, you cannot regulate Bitcoin because nobody owns it. You cannot That's take the, the server down. There's no one server to take down. There is no one company to take down. Okay. So if we are using it, so it's like this. So let's say the government comes with a rule tomorrow saying that you know what. You cannot uh, trade coffee, but only Starbucks can trade coffee. Okay, you can go to a Starbucks and you can buy coffee. And let's say the uh, Starbucks has put a, a censorship on Nathan, that's me, saying that you are not allowed to buy coffee from Starbucks. Let's say for hypothetical cases. And let's say David is drinking a coffee out there. He's, took, he's taken a coffee. I go to him and say, David, I'm going to give you my iPhone. Will you give me, my, will you give me your coffee? There's no way he's going to refuse that offer, even if there is a rule. So that's one thing. And the second piece is, nowadays when banks, so let's say I go to my bank and I do a wire transfer to David in Australia. So the wire goes from my bank to the Federal Reserve, and from there it goes to the Nostro account for their bank in Australia. It goes to David's account. But realistically, the clearing and settlement happens over a week. When I send David or anybody in London a Bitcoin or a Litecoin or Ethereum, 
the asset goes to them within one minute or 10 minutes. The slower one, Bitcoin, it does in 10 minutes. Maybe the confirmation times take longer okay, because gonna, of the fees we're gonna and have to leave it. We're going to have to leave it there. In a minute. Gentlemen, sorry to cut you off. Thank you for all your different opinions when it comes to this. Certainly a fascinating subject and one we all have to get our heads wrapped around. Nathan Epen, Martin Bakadax and David Vall. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com for further discussion. Go to our Facebook page, that's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story from me, Jane Dutton, and the whole team. Goodbye. <laughs>